Chapter 5, Medical Terminology. This chapter here is pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot that uh, can be discussed that the PowerPoint itself doesn't uh, readily address or the chapter in the book itself. Um, a lot of this is terminology, basic understanding. So something that uh, if you haven't covered this prior in emergency medical responder or other courses, you'll definitely want to get this dialed in. Uh, medical terminology is something that's going to become part of your everyday life. And although we do use plain English when we discuss things with our patients or with family members, um, anything that we read within our protocol books or even discussion among each other, a lot of times will contain this medical terminology. So getting into the, uh, the meat and potatoes here, uh, medical terms are typically uh, divided into compound words, meaning that if we look at the word, there's probably two separate words that are used to make it up, sometimes three words. And if we look at those base words, we might be able to determine what, in fact, the word means if we haven't seen it before. Um, so in this case here, they're using smallpox as an example. Uh, but I think if we move on, you'll, you'll understand a little bit more. So words made, made from parts. You've got the roots themselves. So thermal uh, or therm meaning heat. Roots with uh, their combining form then if we add thermometer. Meter obviously meaning to measure something. So if we know meter means to measure something, therm means heat, it means that if we have a thermometer, or we pronounce it thermometer, that actually means that we're measuring heat. Um, we have prefixes then that can be added on to the beginning of a word that explains something. So in this case here, they're using dyspnea or tachypnea. Uh, dyspnea means, uh, actually dys is a, a prefix that means to hurt or painful. Um, but we typically associate dyspnea with difficulty breathing. Um, tachypnea then would indicate a, a, a elevated respiratory rate. Suffixes are things that are added on to the end of a word then. So itis meaning inflammation of, um, and then, well, let's go into a couple more and I think it'll make more sense. So looking at this here, we have tachy or fast, um, cardia meaning heart, and then tachycardia fast heart rate. Hemo, meaning blood. Thorax, meaning chest. Hemothorax, now we know that we have blood in the chest cavity. Cardiologist, we have cardio, again, meaning the heart. Uh, ology, meaning the study of. And then ist, somebody who specializes in something. So cardiologist is somebody who studies and specializes in the heart. Acronym, uh, acronyms are going to be used all over the place in EMS, and acronyms help us to abbreviate what would otherwise be pretty long words and help us to remember them. Uh, so CPAP is the example used here. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. Um, and what is unique about an acronym is that we can actually put it together and pronounce it as a word. So CPAP in this case. Um, and I'll tell you what, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, hey, grab me the continuous positive airway pressure. It is commonly known as CPAP and referred to as such. We also have abbreviations. So using the example DNR, DNR itself, we have to say each individual letter. We can't pronounce that as a word. Well, I guess we could try, uh, but that really doesn't work, does it? So we're going to use each individual letter, DNR, do not resuscitate. Uh, pulsed, Think about pulse. So pulse is actually something that uh, has substituted a DNR. We talked about that in Chapter 4. Uh, in this case, since we can uh, say the word pulse, even though it is an abbreviation, uh, we refer to it as an acronym because it's something we can pronounce as a word. And as a refresher, pulse means physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. So here you see bolded and underlined, do not use when speaking to patients or family members. When we're talking to, to patients or people who don't understand medical terminology, uh, we want to be sure that we are uh, speaking in, in plain English, plain language that they can understand. We don't want to confuse them. And a lot of times, medical terminology, even terminology that, that doesn't mean anything bad whatsoever, can be intimidating and misunderstood. So if I am um, interpreting somebody's EKG, I may be talking to my partner and saying, Boy, ICST elevation leads to 3 and AVF with reciprocal changes. We have a, a widened QRS, and it uh, looks like we do have some ST depression also. Um, and all those things, while that 
actually does signal something that's bad, uh, is very foreign to the patient. So we'd want to break it down and say, okay, we're looking at your EKG here. Uh, it does show that there are some abnormalities going on with the heart. These are things that are concerning to us. We want to administer some medication and get you to the hospital right away. Um, although the EKG isn't the uh, only way we can diagnose a, a heart attack, it does suggest that there could be something going on with the heart right now. We break it down and we explain it in a way that they can understand. And it also opens up to allow them to ask appropriate questions if need be. And again, going back to chapter four, if we can't properly inform the patient, and that means informing them in a way that they understand, then they cannot provide expressed consent. Now, translate this to somebody who does not speak English. If we have a Spanish-speaking individual and we're unable to communicate with them effectively, can they give expressed consent? The answer would be no. Fortunately, we do have a handful of resources available to us that allow us to interpret what we're saying and what the patient is saying. Um, one option would be to call the hospital and they have an interpreter line, so we can call in there. Um, another option would be we, we actually carry a Spanish-English dictionary in the uh, ambulance, but that can be awfully time-consuming and doesn't necessarily uh, translate the way we want it to. Um, the best option that I found as of recently is the app Google Translate, and it'll actually work for conversational purposes, and that way we're not limited to just Spanish either. Any language that's out there is available through Google. We can download the language content. Uh, I can simply speak into the phone. The phone hears what I say, uh, said, and it translates it, and it'll re-say it then in whatever language we want it to. German, um, Chinese, Spanish, you name it, it'll work. Uh, and I've actually taken people who are fluent in other languages, and I've practiced with it to make sure that the translation is accurate, and they've all said that it does a really good job. So again, Google Translate would be a good resource for you. All right, anatomy and physiology. So anatomy simply means the study of body structure and physiology study of body function. So looking at this here, this gives us a, a good view of all the different directional terms that we can use uh, when trying to describe the body. And I'm not gonna go through and, and read every word in this PowerPoint or, or read every word in these illustrations. You're gonna have to go through and really study these, but I will quickly summarize. And note the difference between anterior and posterior. Uh, you're going to see those used pretty frequently. Anterior meaning to the front of the body, posterior meaning toward the back. Now we have this, um, this vertical plane that divides front from back in the body. It's called the frontal or coronal plane. And anything that lies essentially from the middle of my arm or middle of my torso forward is going to be considered anterior. And anything behind that line toward the back is going to be posterior. Superior and inferior, you also see, uh, also see that quite frequently. And uh, you may remember the superior and inferior vena cavas. So the vena cavas, those are the main veins that are returning blood back to the heart itself. They drain into the right atrium. Um, the vena cava that comes from below the heart is called the inferior vena cava. And the vena, ca uh, vena cava that comes from the top of the heart is called the superior vena cava. So it doesn't necessarily, although superior and inferior typically refer to near the head or near the foot, respectively, um, it, they are what's called associated words. So it is associated to the item or object that you're referring to. And in this case, we're using the heart. So anything that would be, of, or the veins above the heart would be the superior vena cava, and below the heart would be the inferior vena cava. When we are... Referring to our patient and different, using different anatomical terms, we want to picture them in the anatomical position. And the anatomical position is, if we go back one slide, exactly what you see. Somebody who is facing forward, um, hands down at their side, and palms forward. That is the anatomical position. So anytime we use anatomical terms, we're going to picture that our patient is in that position, regardless of the position that they are actually in. Um, and doing so then, we can divide the body into planes, as you saw in the previous image, uh, and then the midline. So the midline is really important. That actually splits uh, right. That splits your body left or right, and it goes right down the center of your nose, center of your mouth, center of your chest, all the way down, uh, travels through the belly button, and down into the groin. And using that line dead center in your body allows us to determine things that are uh, left or right, but also allows us to determine things that are medial or lateral. So the term medial will refer to something that is close to the midline, 
whereas lateral would mean something that is further from the midline or out closer toward the edge of the body. The term bilateral, meaning both sides, uh, when we listen to lung sounds, we'll say, yes, patient has uh, good lung sounds bilaterally. And that means that we've listened to the lungs on both the left and right side and that both, uh, both sets of lungs are clear. Unilateral, meaning one. Uh, and again, using lungs as the example, that's something we refer to quite often. So we may say that the patient only has unilateral chest rise. So that suggests that only one side of their chest is rising with each breath rather than both or bilateral like it's supposed to. If I have uni uh, unilateral chest rise, I begin thinking, okay, what's wrong with the opposite side, with the side that's not rising as it's supposed to? What's wrong there? Do I have a tension pneumothorax or a hemothorax? Do I have some type of flail segment? And I begin thinking about all the issues that could be going on there. The mid-axillary line, uh, it runs right through your, uh, the side of your body, your armpit. And again, the mid-axillary line refers to the sagittal plane there. Um, it splits front from back. All right, anterior, posterior, we talked about. You'll also see alternative words that can be used, ventral and dorsal. Uh, so think about a dorsal fin on a um, dolphin. The dorsal fin is always on the dolphin's back. So dorsal or posterior always referring to the back. Uh, all right, superior and inferior recovered. Proximal means something closer to the torso, whereas distal means further from the torso. And again, that's relative. So I can't simply say that my um, elbow is distal or proximal because there's no, no relative term that I'm using there. I could say, though, that my uh, fingers are distal to my elbow because the, my fingers related to the elbow are further away. I could say that my uh, knee is proximal to my foot because the knee is closer to the torso than the feet. But I typically are gonna, I'm gonna have to have some type of word that I'm associating or using as a, as a relative um, term. Palmer and plantar, palmer means the, the palm of your hands, plantar means the bottom or sole of your feet. And then a few other things here that divide the body into different sections. So we will routinely refer to the head as the cranium, the chest as the thoracic, uh, thorax or thoracic cavity, uh, abdomen as the abdominal cavity, and the pelvis as the pelvic cavity. Um, we then obviously have our extremities, upper and lower, referring to our arms and our legs. And then we can obviously divide them down even more than that. So again, some additional images here that... Uh, illustrate all the words that we've been discussing. Be sure that you go through and you understand all of these. The midclavicular line. So your clavicle or your collarbone, uh, if you find the, the center of it and draw a line straight down vertically, uh, that would be your midclavicular line. And we're gonna use that when doing certain procedures. Uh, we may use that for uh, putting a EKG leads on, for instance, or when we are trying to find an appropriate site for needle decompression as a paramedic, you'll refer to those. So again, these are all just reference points on the body to make sure that our procedures are being done where they belong. Another image, lots of pictures in this. Can't really talk about pictures. You need to use your eyes to look at them. Abdominal quadrants then. Um, so this is actually pretty unique because when people think about abdominal quadrants, they take their belly area and they divide it in half, um, top from bottom, left from right, and they call those their, their quadrants. Well, that's not actually the truth. Um, your belly button is the intersection between upper and lower, left and right. So what that means is that your upper abdominal quadrants are substantially larger than your lower abdominal quadrants. Your lower abdominal quadrants extend down into the top of the pelvic girdle whereas your upper quadrants go all the way up just below the nipple line there. Um, your spleen and your liver are actually tucked up underneath the rib cage just a little bit there. So your ab abdominal cavity essentially goes, your, or your upper, um, upper quadrants rather, go from your belly button up to just below the nipple line there. There's a, a pretty large uh, area for, uh, pretty large area for your organs to be contained in. And again, uh, here's a picture that illustrates just that. Using the belly button as top from bottom and left from right, it shows where all these are. You do need to know each and everything in this picture. You need to know where all of those, excuse me, where all those organs are at, and you need to be able to label those on a diagram if required on a quiz. Hint, hint. 
Some other positional terms, supine, mean laying on our back. So if we're laying on our back facing up, uh, that's a supine position, whereas prone means laying on our stomach facing down. Uh, most times when we're dealing with our patients, we would expect them to be in the supine position because that allows them to not only see what's going on, but it also allows us to adequately maintain and uh, observe the airway and provide any interventions that we may need to. Um, I can't think of many instances where you would transport a patient in the prone position unless, of course, they had significant trauma to their back, um, burns, for instance, that would prevent them from laying on their back. Um, or if they had something impaled or something like that. Those would be instances to transport them in the prone position. Other than that, though, everybody should be facing up or supine. Recovery position is either left or right. Uh, and we can also say that if they're laying on one of their sides, depending on the side they're on, that they are in the left lateral recumbent or right lateral recumbent positions. Picture of supine. Picture of prone picture in this case of the lateral recumbent or in this since they're on the left this would be left lateral recumbent position when we transport our patients on the cots um, more times than not they're going to be in this exact position here which is semi fowlers semi fowlers means that the back is elevated at a plus or minus 45 degree angle full fowlers means that they would be sitting straight up on the cot full fowler is pretty uncommon it's actually an uncomfortable position uh, because it requires the legs to remain straight out in front of them uh, and then it bends the body at a 90 degree angle, something that uh, most people are not comfortable in. What we may see is somebody who is transported in the Fowler's position, meaning again that the back is straight up and down at a 90 degree angle, but what they'll do then is they'll drape their feet over the sides of the cot and they'll allow their feet to rest on the floor. This is typically done for patients who are in respiratory distress. They need to sit straight up because it takes some of the pressure or some of the weight off their lungs. It allows their chest cavity to expand the best that it can. And then they drape their feet down on the floor so that they're in a more comfortable position. And that's really it. Uh, there are quite a few other uh, terms and positions that we will begin to use throughout the year. This is simply just a basic introduction. Um, but I can assure you that each and every one of the terms in this chapter you will be using it for the remainder of your career. You do need to know what they mean. So be sure to study these, uh, create flashcards, use My Brady Lab online, or any of the other resources that are available to you. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day.